I'm Jareth Kopis, and this is Notes from Underground. After an extended hiatus, I've returned to my YouTube channel. All my other options are slowly disappearing. My Twitter account has been disabled permanently. Now, I find myself having a little extra time to come back to these videos. The U.S. media has officially become an operation focused on wartime anti-Russian propaganda. No other voices are being allowed, and those that dare to are quickly being shut down. One of the most egregious lies being spewed forth is that Nazism and fascism are not found in Ukraine. Let's set that record straight. The roots of Ukrainian ultranationalism run deep, gaining prominence in 1919 at the end of the Polish-Ukrainian War. This short war originated in ethnic differences between a number of groups in the area of Galicia. The House of the Habsburgs, who were sympathetic and lenient towards national minorities, ruled Galicia, a part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. This leniency allowed for the growth of numerous nationalist movements. Archduke Wilhelm of Austria, whom had adopted a Ukrainian identity, sent two regiments of Ukrainian troops hand-picked into Lemberg, which is modern-day Alvov as the Austro-Hungarian Empire fell apart. These two regiments set about creating what became known as the Ukrainian National Council, later known as the Verkhovna Rada. The main purpose of this was uniting the lands of western Ukraine into one state. The Poles were looking to take control of the area as well, but were defeated by Dmitro Vitovsky, who took control of the area, proclaiming it as West Ukrainian People's Republic, and named its capital in Elvov. This proclamation took many who lived in the areas by surprise. Much of the area still had a majority of ethnic Poles as its population, specifically in eastern Galicia, Volynia, Carpathian Ruthenia, Bukovina, and overnight these Poles found themselves now no longer living in Poland, but Ukraine. Neither country had a true claim over the area since it had just recently been part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it boiled down to a matter of military might. Local militias opposed the Ukrainian Galician armies with self-defense units that consisted mostly of Polish students, World War I veterans, and even children. These ragtag groups took advantage of the knowledge provided by the World War I veterans and were able to hold their own against the poorly organized and tactically weak Ukrainian attacks. The Polish were adept at buying time through the use of ceasefires, during which they would simply regroup and reinforce their positions before beginning their attack again and breaking the ceasefire. The Polish resistance also had a great amount of support from the local population, seeing as the area, until Ukraine claimed it as their own, was part of what was considered Poland. This feeling of many of the inhabitants led to the seeing of the Ukrainians as invaders, prompting a strong resistance rather than an acceptance of new rule. Fighting raged on, spilling over into smaller areas around the Alvov region until Lieutenant Colonel Michael Karashevitz Tokarczewski was able to push through into the Alvov with a large contingency of Polish troops and take the city. Reported widespread looting took place and as many as 300 civilians were killed. The Poles sought to cut off any further support for the Ukrainians, putting a great deal of activists and resistance leaders in detention camps. By November of 1918, Poland controlled Alvov and the railway that connected it to central Poland. The Ukrainians still held smaller locations, as well as eastern Galicia, leaving them the ability to attack Delvov on three different sides. Poland continued claiming new territories and retaking previously established ones that Ukraine had sought as their own. Ukraine attempted to reciprocate the same actions of conquering and reclaiming, leading the opposing forces into an endless cycle of defeats and victories, with neither gaining much actual ground. Ukrainian People's Republic commander Simon Petlura, member of the Sikh Rifleman, came to prominence and was gaining an infamous reputation. An ultra-nationalist, Petlura planned many and took part in numerous crimes which included murder, robbery, rape, and looting. While under his command from 1917 to 1921, the Ukrainians carried out pogroms targeting the Poles, Jews, and Russians. Conservative estimates state that over 30,000 were killed. Some sources saying the number could be as high as 156,000 innocent people's lives lost. Because of his actions as commander, his life was cut down in 1926. While in Paris, Petlura was approached by a, na a man named Shalom Schwarzbard, who in Ukrainian asked him, Are you Mr. Petlura? 
that Lura raised his cane in acknowledgement. Schwarzbard then pulled a gun from his coat, yelled, Dirty dog, killer of my people, defend yourself, and then shot him five times. Schwarzbard turned himself in immediately with a note reading that he killed Petlura to avenge the death of the thousands of pogrom victims in Ukraine who were massacred by Petlura's forces without his taking any steps to prevent these massacres. These deaths included 15 of his family members. Schwarzbard, despite having admitted to, kill to the killing, was acquitted, only having to pay one franc each as damages to Petlura's widow and brother. Somehow, in modern-day Ukraine, Simon Petlura has become a symbol of Ukrainian independence. A feature-length film was made about him in 2018 to rewrite the history, showing him as heroic and brave for the role he played. Many politicians, such as President Yushchenko, celebrated Petlura as a hero, despite his genocidal acts, erecting monuments and glorifying his name and memory. The Ukrainian forces rallied and were able to put Alvov under a successful siege that allowed them to stall further conflicts and swell their ranks, giving them a decisive advantage in numbers, but were unable to successfully use it due to their general lack of military knowledge. In December of 1918, Ukraine attempted to storm the city of Alvov, but were repulsed after Polish reinforcements arrived. The Ukrainians regrouped and brought in new peasant troops from western Ukraine. The Ukrainian forces again attacked Alvov, now with these untested troops, and again were beaten back, leading to many eastern Ukrainian troops to mutiny, blaming the western Ukrainian troops for the defeat. By February, Ukraine was able to pull back together and commence another assault on Alvov. By this time, all Polish supply lines into Alvov had been severed. The time was ripe to take the city. Luckily for the Polish, a French-led mission from the Entente arrived just in time at the Ukrainian headquarters, demanding that all hostilities cease, or the ties between the French Entente and the Ukrainian government would be severed. The Ukrainians promptly called off their attack, and ceasefire discussions began. A demarcation line was set in place, which gave Ukraine a sizable chunk of the East Galician territory, while giving Poland all of Elvov, including all of its oil fields but Ukraine would take possession of half of the produce produced oil from the fields. The Polish easily and happily agreed to the terms, but the Ukrainian delegation was insulted by the heavily Polish-favored terms and left the discussion to continue their assault on Alvov. Because the Polish were under the assumption that a ceasefire had been reached, the Ukrainians were able to cause mass confusion in the Polish ranks, leading to their defenses being opened up. They blew up large Polish ammo stores in Alvov, but once again, the inexperienced Ukrainians couldn't take advantage of this and again fell back to regroup. Poland was very busy during the ceasefire and deployed a relief force of 10,000 troops that marched to Alvov, clearing Ukrainian strongholds as they went. By March, they had secured Alvov and the surrounding areas. The Polish mounted a large-scale offensive in 1919 and with the aid of the, of the troops received from Western allies, France in particular, they were able to defeat and push back even the most elite of Ukrainian forces, the Sikh Riflemen, and declare the Polish territory along the boundary lines they had wished. The Ukrainian defeat did not sour the nationalism felt by Ukrainians, but only intensified it. This loss acted as a catalyst that pushed even the most fervent ultra-nationalist into a form of extremism that would infect Ukraine for years to come. One of the organizations to be born of this extremism was the Ukrainian Military Organization, or the UVO. The UVO was a group of Ukrainian veterans who covertly planned on continuing fighting the Polish through a number of different tactics. Strictly made up of former military men, a rigid military-style structure was installed by their leader, Yevhen Konovalets. Ukrainian nationalism, fascism, Nazism, whatever you want to call it, in no way began with Hitler. This was an ideology that had already had taken firm root in the psyche of the Ukrainian people and would only grow. In the next video of this series, we will be talking about this growth, this abscess, by taking a detailed look at the UVO. Now more than ever, it's important to consume media responsibly. Don't take my word for anything. Look into it for yourself. Listen to every side. It's only when we all have a clear view of the entire picture that we can truly bring war to the war makers.